Okay, Community Matters, I'm Jay Fidel. It's a two o'clock block on a given Monday. You know, we talk about coronavirus, we talk about the things we need to do. And um, one, of the, one of the combination things that we haven't done really, I don't care what they say in Washington, is, is we haven't had enough good testing, information gathering and tracing. And we need to take a scientific look at that because if you wanna reopen the economy, you gotta do everything possible first for public health. It's not hard to do it but we have to do it smart. And Mike DeWert, our chief scientist, uh, has taken a look at this and he's here to tell us the scientific view of testing and tracing. Not complicated, or is it, Mike? <laughs> it's more complicated than you might hope, but it's, it's basically straightforward. Um, the uh, fact is, if you want to be able to reopen businesses, you've got to have the kind of businesses where they can actually gather information that would let you con trace contacts if necessary. Um, and um, it's all possible. We've seen, you know, on the mainland, a lot of anecdotal evidence that beauty salons can stay open if, even if they've had a couple of cases where uh, the, one of the hairdressers in the salon had COVID, but she was masked, her customers were masked, and they were doing everything sanitation-wise very carefully, and nobody got COVID except her. Um, then when they found out, of course, she had to sanitize the salon and, and keep her home. You know, quarantined. So, but so I'd like, kind of like to start out with a snapshot of where we are right now in terms yeah. of disease progression. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. So, on this chart, is the chart up? The first chart? Yeah, there it is. Yeah, there we go. So, back in February, when I first started tracking this, um, that there's a magenta box here. So, this scale vertically is a logarithmic scale. So, every big division is another factor of 10 more. And uh, you look at the world, U.S. and Hawaii, we're always all about doubling every four days or so. And so, uh, you know, an exponential growth on this will look like a straight line. Mm -hmm. So we are all doubling every four days or so. Then starting in March, April, everybody started locking down and uh, quarantining and restricting activity. That bent the curves over a bit. It didn't crush them, except Hawaii was able to crush its curve for a while, reduce the new cases to nearly zero. Um, the rest of the world and the United States seem to have transitioned to a slower exponential, but they're still on an exponential growth. Having said that, we've already worldwide probably delayed hundreds of millions of cases of COVID-19. The gray line shows where we would have gone. Um, it's literally off the chart. If we hadn't, if the world hadn't instituted lockdowns and quarantines, we would be off the chart right now in cases. Um, USA right now looks like it's doubling every a month or so. Hawaii is um, actually a more about 38 day doubling time, but Hawaii has actually seemed to bend up again. Since we started reopening, our curve going from being crushed has gone to actually a faster growth, it looks like, than the U.S. as a whole. Mm -hmm. It's around a 30 day doubling. Now we still have a few cases. You know, with only 1,200 odd cases in Hawaii, we can still do contact tracing, we can still do all the testing. Um, the state has to decide how many cases per day is going to be acceptable. I'm estimating that we, with the current hospitalization rate, we could handle up to 600 cases a day, which sounds like a horrible lot, and it is. Um, but we can handle that many before we overwhelm the healthcare system with people in hospital and ICUs. Um, and even at that rate, it would take us four and a half years to get to herd immunity. So we are a long way from done with this pandemic. We are a long way from done with this. Well, one, one question is if you, if you try to suppress the curve and all, um, you, know, you have to have certain tools and you have to have certain timing. Right. Um, it, you have to take certain steps. Right. But it's that gray line at the, at the center of your chart that really scares me. That's the line where you don't do anything and it just goes right. out of control. Well, yeah. Sure. And, yeah, so that's a, that one's a good news. I, sh I should have shown the whole graph. I should, it's a good news, bad news story. If we had done nothing, the pandemic would be over because we'd have millions of people dead and there'd be nobody left to infect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, all right. And, so, and the healthcare system would have collapsed as well. So. Yeah. <laughs> so th there's going to be, a, there's going to be, this is my proposition to you. I'd right. like to know if it's true, that testing and tracing is useful up right. to a point, right? but then you get to a certain inflection point where testing and tracing can't help. 
where the thing is uh, more like the gray line it's out of control yeah and yeah. you might as well just sit back and enjoy it because no no tools will work am i right about that is well there a if you don't do that what you're stuck with is shutting down businesses and quarantining which yeah. you, know, you see in california they're having to do it i'm doing it in arizona Texas, Florida, they have to shut down businesses and quarantine, which is a very blunt tool. But if you don't do the testing and you don't do the tracing, it's all you got is shutdowns and lockdowns. And it, it really is best for the economy if you can do the testing, tracing, hire the contract tracers we need um, and, and do it right. Um, there's some so businesses- We may are, be there in some states. In there, Hawaii, are, yeah. there, there, are, there are 22 states which are spiking like crazy right now it's the, the mm -hmm. number expands every day yeah. um and so those some of those states the only as you say the only thing you do is lockdown and it's too right. late am i right too late yeah I, I think you're right i mean and, and then people in the mainland the officials and some of the cdc officials and uh, some of trump's officials said yeah it's too late we've lost control we can't do anything in terms of tracing and testing um and actually i have a a uh, niece in St. Louis, she she and her husband took their kids to um, a, a literally, not literally, a high school baseball tournament in Memphis. Now, why they went, I don't know. They tried to mask, they tried to social distance the best they could at this tournament. Apparently, it wasn't enough. Both parents came down with COVID. And they have different symptoms, but they're both sick with it. They will not test the kids because the kids aren't showing symptoms because there's a shortage of tests. The problem is, Half of the disease transmission, it looks like, comes from asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic car carriers. So even though the kids aren't showing symptoms, they could still be sick, they could still be transmitting, and more li most likely are if they've actually got the virus in their systems. And this lack of testing is just making it impossible. Now, you, there's no way to trace because you haven't tested them and you don't know then who to, what the data really say. Yeah, so you've got to collect the information. Um, and so another thought is that if we if we could go back, um, back to the time when um, you know we first made efforts to control yeah. the curve and all that, yeah. Yeah. and do an effective program on yeah. testing and tracing, yeah, we could have suppressed it even better than than by the lockdown. Because yeah. we would have identified every case, we would have isolated every case, we would have stopped the infection, the, the rate right. of infection to below one, right? right. Yeah, like New Zealand has, you know, um, we could be like New Zealand um, and, and, and keep the curve crushed. Um, problem is, really, as long as the disease is anywhere in the world, nowhere in the world is really safe. It's only a plane right away. And it, it takes one false negative test to bring it in again. Uh, that's the problem. Uh, we needed a global response. We needed the nations of the world with real leadership, which could have happened. Uh, we could have had real leadership in the United States saying, okay, China screwed up. Let us lead and show how to do this right and make the world a safe place for American commerce again. I mean, we could have done it. It would have only taken a couple months, but we didn't. But so you know, when, when he got up and said, anybody who wants a test can get a test, that wasn't true. It isn't true now. It isn't true and now. Like I say, my... And yeah. we didn't do tracing. I mean, you actually you have to have testing to do tracing. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. We didn't do tracing either. So we yeah. lost the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We In Hawaii, I don't think we have lost the opportunity, but it's going to be really hard with the rest of the United States not doing anything. Uh, but we know that there's certain businesses that can open safely with precautions. Like on the next page, I show an example of, um, like they're saying hair salons and barber shops. Uh, masking has been shown to be very effective in that setting. So barbershop I go to, Kai Ohe, they've got all, all these procedures that the governor has said you got to do, they sanitize, they do everything. Customers, employees all wear masks. You've got to have a mask to go in. And there's not a lot of chit chat because you know talking a lot increases the risk. So there's not a lot of banter between the customers and the, and the barbers. Um, they do temperature checks. Now, temperature checks aren't very specific, but at least it is a screening. They ask a question if you've been on foreign travel or travel outside of Y in the last two weeks. That helps. Um, they restrict access. Only the people actually getting their hair cut can go in. You know? and, but most importantly, they log who's there, when they came in, and their name and phone number. 
that log lets, if they do have somebody who went to that barber shop or works in that shop test positive, they can now do contact tracing. They know who to call, who to warn that they may have been exposed. And so, so that's, that's critical. You have Businesses have to do that. You have Pardon an me? operator, a, a, a barber shop, a barber in this barber shop right. Right. develops a, a positive, a positive right. test. Then you go back to that log and look at that log and see who did that barber have contact with. And now you're often running on a, on a pretty valid tracing experience. Right, 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 right. Now, so you've gathered the data. Now, there's some businesses where it's hard to do that, like open a bar. I mean, our bar is really going to log the name and phone number of everybody that walks through the door and when they walk through the door. They might, but I haven't heard of that actually happening. So, but that's what it would take is being able to do that. And uh, then some places like gyms, they try to do everything right, but a gym, you're inherently breathing hard. It might just be impossible in that gym to be safe. Um, but still, they gather the data. And I'm amazed that the uh, government, the health department was able to trace the two outbreaks at gyms here on Oahu to one person that went to both gyms. They were able to identify, in a sense, patient zero for those two outbreaks. And that's because they could do contact tracing and had the data to do it. So businesses which can gather the data can possibly reopen. Businesses where it's somehow impossible to gather the data, I don't know. They may have to stay closed. And not, when I say business, I mean activities too. I mean, you, if, if you've got a big foot race like a Honolulu Marathon or if you've got some kind of big outdoor worship service, you, you still got to be able to collect the data so that you can warn people if they happen to be exposed. And well, but if you have a large group, let's say um, a church service and 200 yeah. people show up, yeah. and then out of that church service, one person, you know, tests positive. Right. Um, I suppose you can go back. Now you, you have, you're off and running to do tracing on everybody who was there, right. everybody who signed up that he was right. there. Um, right. And, and that, that is doable, although it requires a significantly greater effort by yeah. the tracing department. Oh, yeah. They're going to have to phone up 200 people. Yeah, yeah because, um, y y yeah, you have to phone up 200 people. And uh, the next page kind of shows some numbers here that you have to have. Um, the uh, It's a pretty labor intensive process. They estimate, the experts estimate that for the United States, we need 100,000 to 300,000 tracers. And we got like 30,000 right now. Hawaii is doing a bit better. We might need 400 or so, um, and we've got 147 that are still recruiting, which is good. So you, you, you need about 30 tracers for every 100,000 people in your state. And so that's about 400 or so for Hawaii. And, uh, and that's a lot of work. It's a full-time job calling people. You've got to be a diplomat. You've got to be super careful about privacy. You can't disclose the name of the person you think gave it to the person you're talking to. And, and, but if you at least you can trace down the people who have been exposed. Right now, if you don't test though, you can only ask them to self-quarantine, which then you'll be quarantining a lot more people than maybe you had to. So, but if you want to so, do tracing, go ahead. I, I wanted to ask you what that conversation was like. Can we role play a conversation? Okay, oh, I'll, I'll, you're going to be the caller. I, I've not person. had the training, so I can't really tell you how to, how to how, what the trainer. Rough, the rough trainer idea, rough did. idea. And I'll be, uh, I'll be the person you, you want to get the data from. Go ahead. Oh, uh, well, aloha, Mr. Fidel. Um, we have a reason to suspect you've probably been exposed to COVID-19. Uh, we're just going to check up on you, uh, see if you have symptoms. Um, uh, and, and then I would ask, you know, if you have a fever, do you have a cough? How do you feel? Um, but you have to be, I have to, I'd have to be more diplomatic than I am to do that. Okay, well, you know, I, I, I don't have COVID, doctor, um, but I, <laughs> I, I, do, I do have a little temperature and I have uh, a headache, have, mm, you know, mm. and um, my, my respiratory not really feeling good and I'm tired all the time, mm, but it's mm. just a little cold. I know it's just a little cold. Okay, thank you very much for the call. Oh, well, what, do you, what do you do with that? Right, right. See, I, mean, I haven't been trained, so I don't know what the next step would be to say, for, well, maybe we suggest you stay home for two weeks, you know, just, you know, just in case. You know. It might just be the flu, but you want to give the flu to anybody either. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, I, I'm just, I raised this because right. not everybody's going to cooperate. 
right? Not everybody's going to cooperate. And it's an implementation problem. You know, you have the theoretically, you could trace me out. You could, you could, you could identify me. Uh, now, now, if there were a law, a constitutional law right. that allowed you to force me to a test, mm. you know, that would, that would be a step ahead. And, and you could probably stop the, the lineage on my virus right there. Um, or at least yeah. I wouldn't be spreading any further. But if I said, no, well, take a walk, yeah. I don't, I don't want you in my life. Goodbye. Uh, well, what, the government does have the right to enforce a quarantine in that case. And that's yeah. been tested. They can say, okay, you got to be quarantined for two weeks uh, unless you're willing to take the test. Um, and they can arrest you and, or fi and fine you, you know, if you're not refuse the quarantine. Now, we don't want to go there. As a contact tracer, you don't want to start with that. Have we gone there? I don't know. I know we, well, we've arrested tourists for breaking quarantine. So okay. we find tourists for breaking quarantine. So it's possible that you could do that, that you could require people. I, I, but I don't think we've actually gone to somebody and said, um, we think you might be, have been exposed. I don't, yeah. And we want you to get tested. If you don't get tested, we're going to arrest you. Yeah. That, that, It'd be really nice to have the Department of Health on, you know. Uh, get Bruce Anderson on or <laughs> somebody like that to tell you what 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 that what power they really wish uh, or foresee and implementing to compel this because um, I haven't heard how many cases they think they're going to be willing to ramp up to either per month um, or per day. You and, mean the, the tracers? Yeah, how many? Yes, how many cases they expect the tracers will have to actually be able to trace per day? Um, well, and, you, figure, uh, you figure it's uh, if there's 170, what is it? 420 of them. Yeah, if they get up that they high, could do, yeah. they could do 420 cases. That's one a day, but you want yeah. them to handle a lot more than that. So Hope just not. if we get a lot more than that, the healthcare system won't be able to handle it unless we can expand its capacity. Yeah. Yeah, it's right now about 10% of people with COVID end up in the hospital, um, and we only have like 800 beds of COVID patients. Yeah. So, yeah, if everybody's sick for 11 days or so, that means we could handle about 600 cases a day, you know, with 60 people then going to the hospital every day, and then hopefully 60 more coming out of the hospital, either dead or healthy, um, every day. Um, and that's, a, don't want to get there. <laughs> no, yeah. but, I, you know, I can see people, you know, you know, it's, it's that old thing about I'm, I'm here from the government to help you. Yeah. Uh, and, and most people, I don't know what all people, but most people would say, thank you, but leave me alone. Um, yeah, they say yeah. that until it times time for the stimulus check. Well, <laughs> right. well there's got to be ways to incentivize them to participate and cooperate. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. That's a good thought. And I don't know what the state has in mind for that. Uh, how we would, what kind of incentives we could put in front of people to actually cooperate. I mean, carrots are usually better than sticks. Uh, but we've had this culture in certain parts of our society where we disparage government workers and talk about how bad they are. But, you know, the government workers I've run into are mostly working very hard to be competent. I've always had a good relationship with the tax office or the postal service and with the business registration people. They're sincerely trying hard to work and do their jobs. And, I agree, I yeah, agree. Yeah, and so these people want to run the government down. You know, it's an ideology of, well, we don't want to pay for any government, so let's not have a government. Let's claim it's all terrible. But, <laughs> you know, so how, how, do you, how do you recruit one of these 420? What, what, uh, who are they going to be? Well, Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, the uh, Department of Health um, has got a joint program with the University of Hawaii. Um, if you have, at least a bachelor's degree in something. They prefer healthcare field, but something, bachelor's degree. And if you have experience in a healthcare clinical setting, you can apply to be a contact tracer and go through a day and a half course, register to be part of the state's reserve medical corps to do the tracing, and then they'll be able to call on you. And they prefer people who are willing to do it full-time as opposed to part-time. Because, um, yeah, if which means they're foreseeing that we're going to have to ramp up to a lot more cases than we have um, do that. And, and the time when a lot of people are out of work, they probably have a large pool they can pick from. 
Because yeah. the reality is it's a telephone job. You don't have to go out in the street. You don't have to, you don't have to meet with people who are right. potentially uh, virus carriers. All you got to do is pick yeah. up the phone. Right. And you got to know, you know, if you, if you do have the opportunity to do a video chat, be able to assess the person's appearance to see, well, are they lying about how well they're feeling? That kind of thing. Mm, video um, chat. That would be better than a phone, wouldn't it? Better than a phone call. But if you can also listen on a phone even for breathing that sounds off, um, railing, or any kind of, if, if you have been in a healthcare setting, you might be better equipped to, to look for those symptoms. Yeah. Or to ask the questions about, about how they feel in a diplomatic way. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. But wouldn't so. you wouldn't you need a, a a pretty good database program? So this individual would fill in the fields on a database, and he oh, would yeah, yeah. he would ask it a lot of questions, and he'd put <laughs> the data in that database, and that database could do some crunching, no? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And, I, and I expect the state has that. If they don't, then it's kind of scary because it's going to be a human being that has to do all that crunching. And yeah. you know, that just adds another bottleneck to the system. Um, but on the other hand, computers can, they're only as good as their programming. And, and somebody could have made a programming error or assumption in programming that leads to, in, you know, incorrect results, you know, and undue suspicion on one group versus another group. However, that, that can be caught, you know, and everything has to be tailored for Hawaii. Hawaii is unique. And uh, um, for example, there was an article in the paper this morning about Marshall Islands people from the Marshall Islands. They have a unique language barrier and they're poor. So they have very little opportunity to avoid crowding. And how do we help them? And uh, so this is, there's a whole bunch of little situations that, that are unique to Hawaii. And so whatever program they get can't be a one size fits all from the mainland. It has to be tailored to our situation. So, yeah, and I, and I suppose you could put all kinds of sophisticated, nuanced uh, data in there. For example, when you were talking to this person, did this person sound like he had a cough? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and you check a box for that. Uh, yeah. So, okay, so you have a lot of data about the conversation, and the conversation is essentially scripted. <clears throat> you're asking, you know, or you're, you know, in a friendly way, you're getting around to certain critical information that you're going to put in this in, in the data fields. Yeah. Now the data fields are crunched. What does it do? Does it create a, a kind of schematic of the people who have had contact with the people? Do they all go in a larger database where you're trying to connect up with other cases elsewhere? Um, this is pretty complicated now. Yeah, it? yeah. Now, like I said, you have these networks. You have the network of, uh, say, churches and a network of people who go to certain health clubs, a network of people in certain sports activities. And if you can line up this person, say, he's he got it at this health club, but he's also active in this paddling team. So now, you know, you've got to look at that now. And then the, the machine, you, the contact tracer may not know that, but the machine might be able to link all those things together and say, here's where the networks are touching each other of, of uh, people who are doing these activities. So this is where we need to go figure out how it could spread or how to prevent it could spread or prioritize the next set of contact tracing that we do. Um, yeah, artificial intelligence sounds really important in a thing like this. Yeah. So I yeah. go to church um, <clears throat> and I'm sitting next to, you could even divide the church up into quadrants or something. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sitting next to somebody who had it. So you're calling me and you're asking me, telling me I've been exposed. Um, then a few days later, you find uh, that there's a health club outbreak. Mm -hmm. And then you find that I belong to a health club because mm -hmm. you asked me that. And then you find out that I went to the health club a couple of days before the outbreak mm -hmm. in the health club. Um, and now you really got a lead. It's like, it's like right. Right. detective work, but it's done by the crunch. It's detective uh, work, yeah. And so, you know, you're connecting, you got to connect all these communities. And then you're going to make a sort of a computer judgment about how close in time mm -hmm. did this happen? What's the incubation period? <laughs> Um, yeah. It's all kinds of factors that go in. Yeah. I would love to program something like that, wouldn't you? I doubt. Fun. I it doubt it's fun. very sophisticated right now. You and me, Mike, we could really make a sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, like I say, there's a lot of physicists who are taking their networking network <laughs> math experience and trying to apply it to this. And it, it, it would definitely be. It's a hard little problem, an interesting problem, and an important problem. And there's a lot of people who I don't, I don't know a lot, but there's. 
a, a cadre of people who could actually start tackling it if they haven't already tackled it for the state. Um, so that would be, yeah, it's a hard, important problem that's also very interesting and, and critical, critical to solve. So yeah, and you're right, AI is perfect for this, for crunching these huge numbers. So once you've done the contact tracing, the, really the next step is the testing. Um, this, now this is the testing of somebody who is in the line of fire, who your right. AI is telling you, this person pr is high risk. This person right. might very well have caught it. And, and right. somebody, maybe the machine, maybe you, ha ha or mm. public health uh, expert, is going to make a decision that this right. person is so close to right. the action, to the, to the, the infection, that right. we have to test him. Right, right, right. And the, so there's two kinds of tests. There's antibody tests that test where you've been exposed in the past to the disease. <clears throat> Then there's the uh, DNA RNA test that says, do you have actual virus RNA in you? Um, the antibody tests aren't so good for contact tracing because right now they have like a 10% false positive rate. So if you, so on average, a COVID-19 victim gives two to three other people the disease. So if you know 100 people, maybe you gave two of them the disease, but if you know 100 people and there's a 10% false positive rate, you have 10 other people you're gonna to have to, uh, you, that you're gonna falsely say have the disease if you just use the antibody test. And now you've got 10 people quarantined that don't need to be quarantined. Yeah. So what you really need to do is to give everybody the PCR test, you know, the one where it's up your nose, uh, uncomfortable, although throat swabs are almost as effective and there may even be some evidence of salivary tests, which are you could do it for yourself at home, you know, spit into a tube, send it to the lab, um, are as effective in the first week that you have the disease. Um, after the first week, you have to go deeper into the lungs or have people cough up sputum and test that. Uh, but in the first week, after, if you, that's where you got to jump on the contact tracing right away because you do the least invasive possible test, but you can still do a good test. You, now it takes a couple of days right now to get back your RNA DNA test, the PCR test. And that's a long time, but on the main line, it's taken weeks for some people to get their tests back. That's just too long. I mean, you have no well, choice it's, to quarantine. It's gonna get, it's gonna get longer though. You know, Roche uh, made these certain trays, I think for the testing and mm -hmm. the supply line got cut. Something about China, uh, the supply line got cut. So now it's gonna, it's, you can't get it. And Hawaii is a victim of that. We yeah. can't get those testing right. trays and right. result is it's going to take longer and maybe a long time. Right. Um, so uh, I want to mention that there are there are other possibilities for testing. Mm -hmm. There are right. scientists uh, all over the country working right. on trying to get a fast test. Right. And the holdup is not in the science, Mike. The holdup is in the FDA because the, well, the FDA yeah. is, is, is you know besieged with these ap applications for approval. Right. Yeah, and we don't want them to just rubber stamp them because some of the some of the applications may be not based on good data. So the FDA has to be careful about it. But this problem we have where the FDA is starved and criticized instead of being supported and funded makes it just that much harder. Yeah. And this bias we have against foreign testing, you know, somebody in Singapore might have a great test that they've got a lot of data on they can say this is ready for u.s approval and the u.s may say no no you're from singapore uh i don't know that's happened but i can envision that happening and we need to be uniting as a world to fight this disease this is an existential threat to our world economy we need to actually get together as a world and treat it as a space alien coming to invade us because that's what it is it's a new organism that's not us that wants to kill us so yeah we should <clears throat> We should uh, do sanctions against them. <laughs> against the coronaviruses? <laughs> yeah, obviously trying to uh, uh, un un um, uh, undermine his election, so he should do sanctions. He probably will. Uh, but joke aside, let yeah. me ask you this question. So if one of these, um, you know, startup uh, testing uh, right. laboratories are in the state, they're in, they're in college campuses mostly, right. Uh, right. And, they, and, tr and they're all trying to make a fast test. Right. And maybe with sputum, you know. Um, yeah. So, so if one of them prevails and gets approved um, and becomes available, because there's manufacturing right. issues also, China yeah. would probably <laughs> have to be the one manufacturing it. But let's assume we can get the tests out on the street, like Trump 
promised us. He told us, he swore to us back in what, February. Right. Um, and we all have tests now. And, and the tests are, are sort of like a pregnancy test uh, where you, know, you, can, you can watch the chemical reaction visibly in your home, okay? And then you get an answer right there, five minutes. Yeah, I know how possible that is with a PCR test, but yeah, that would be cool if we could do it that way. If we could have that. Assume RNA for this test. discussion, yeah. assume for this discussion that you could do that. That, that it's, it's it's out there somewhere in in the you know at the frontier. This would really expedite our whole effort at the test tracing phenomenon. I mean, system, right? Wouldn't it? Well, it could, but then again, you have to then rely on those people doing the test at home to self-report accurately. I mean, they could say, "Oh, it's pink." Nah, I don't really have it. That's a lie, and throw it out. Or, "Oh, I'm not going to tell anybody this. I don't. I don't want to." I, so That's you, true. You, you got to rely on. You still got to rely on humans or compliance. You still probably have to rely on contact tracing to know who needs to really be tested and whether they're likely lying or not. You know about the results. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Nobody likes it. It's a privacy issue for them. Um, yeah. But we were talking before yeah. about trying to get information incident to the test. So one way is um, you you make them give you the test kit back, and when they yeah. do. You make them give you the information. You make them right. fill out a form. And then you spend way, 50 bucks or something. I don't know. Yeah, well, it's probably going to cost more like 100 but that's okay. <laughs> Hopefully insurance will cover it. Yeah. Um, but the other way is you, you don't send them the test kit until mm. they fill out the form. You want a test kit? Five mm. minutes, no pain, no invasive. Right. Just right. fill out the form. And then you get the data in advance of the test. Um, yeah. But what? But, but assume for a minute that you could get them to give you the data, get them to take you the test, and that you would have the result of the test. You have to make sure you right. get the results. Right. Of it. right. Would, would that help? Of course it would help. You could see which businesses maybe aren't doing the proper uh, sanitation and proper controls of infection. And it give you an easier in to say maybe which whole industries just aren't able to do it. And then you could target your shutdowns or target your slowdowns or in, come up with a way to get new, new policies and procedures in to make it possible for those kinds of enterprises to stay open, stay functioning. Um, is right now, when you don't do testing, you don't do tracing, you have only the blunt, blunt, blunt instrument of shutting whole, whole industries down. Yeah, right. Very, you're right. It's so blunt. But if you find that I'm, that I'm COVID, yeah. in this test process right, right. And, and, and you made me fill out a form about what I've been doing in right. my life and who I've been with and right. What, right. what events I've visited and so right, forth. Right, right. Then as soon as that result is in, I mean, in five minutes, you're off onto the next trace. Right. right. And so right. that speeds up the process, uh, right. you know, logarithmically. Yeah. And, and if and you have now, AI uh, with its networks of networks that is tracking, that you just put new data into telling you how to prioritize your next contacts on your tracing list. And I think what we really need to make sure this really works is if somebody tests positive for COVID, make sure they can afford to be treated for it. You know, if, if people are afraid to go to the hospital because they're afraid to be bankrupted by their medical bills, they're not gonna cooperate. And- um, Oh, I hadn't even thought of that. Yeah. And if they if they don't want to cooperate, then stay at home or worse yet, go to work. Yeah. Yeah. They're going to they be spreading work. virus all over town. Yeah. Yeah. We got to. And in and, and Hawaii, our health insurance regime is better than average on the mainland. But we still have people that don't have insurance. And we still have people that are underinsured. And we have people that, you know, don't have any sick leave. You know, there's. Uh, people even in healthcare settings whose uh, employers don't provide any paid time off. I mean, there's caregivers for elderly people who simply, the companies that are employing them don't give them any paid time off. And it's like, if they get sick, their choice is don't get paid or risk well, spreading the disease. From a community so, point of view, that's really stupid. It is really stupid um, to, to let the guy let the guy go out there and spread virus, and you know he's got it, and you can make a good guess he's yeah. not getting he's not getting medical care, right. and he's spreading right. the disease. Right, 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 right. So we we really need a whole 
uh, ecosystem of health care and support for people's health in this state, in this country, uh, for all of us to be healthier. You know, if, if there's a whole group of people that are essential to our economy that have no protections, we're all at risk. I mean, you like to think, oh yeah, I'm rich, I can survive this, you know. But the, the virus kills rich people too. And it kills yeah. poor people more, but it does still kill rich people. Yeah. The virus doesn't really care who you are. So yeah. that's, yeah. Um, so who, who, if you had this package, I mean, this slides, these slides and this discussion uh, with a plan, all the points we've talked about and, okay. and how you, who would you take that to? Who would be in a position to implement that? Or is I mean, it multiple, multiple people? Well, yeah, of course you would take it to the governor and to the lieutenant governor and to the Bruce Anderson, the people in charge of the health department. Um, nationally, of course, Fauci, I think, would be on board with it. I mean, but then you've got to somehow convince the, the, the secretary of health and secretary of labor to do this, secretary of commerce to do this, because we're talking about having to ensure everybody in this country that they can get treated for COVID, and you've got an administration that's hostile to universal health insurance, <laughs> that, that makes it really hard. It mm -hmm. makes it really, really hard to control this pandemic. Mm -hmm. So, so I, and I hate to say it, I don't think that it's going to be controlled under this current administration. Um, but states can do things. States can still uh, have some control within their borders, especially Hawaii, especially Alaska. Both got big barriers to the mainland. We don't have people just driving over the border willy-nilly. Um, states like Florida, California, there's long borders with other states. Ooh, that, that's much harder, much harder. Well, all the more reason why Hawaii should focus on this. Yeah. Uh, even, even with tourists coming, Hawaii can design protocols and systems right. to right. use testing and tracing to, right. to effectively stamp it out. And it's much right. better than that blunt instrument approach about closing. Right. But as you pointed out, we've got to be able to do the testing. Yeah. And, and if there's a shortage of tests for whatever scientific or bureaucratic reason, then you can't really reopen the economy for tourists. Yeah. And that would be, that's very bad. We got to insist on the testing being available. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, Mike, I, we're out of time and I, okay. I have to go over to Kaneohe and get a haircut. All right, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Great to talk to you. We'll do it again Thank soon. Thank you. Stay safe. Right, bye bye. Thank you.